Dana is attachment or clinging. Uh, upadana is the condition uh, for bhava, bhava to arise. And bhava is this being, uh, uh, this uh, perception that I am or I exist. Uh, mm. So with being as condition, uh, then jati, birth or rebirth takes place. Uh, with jati as condition, uh, then you have jara, marana, aging and death. Uh, uh, and all the different types of suffering uh, is the origin of suffering. So similarly, uh, one uh, is attached uh, to feeling, perception, volition and, cons- and consciousness. Uh, so being attached to it, uh, then uh, uh, this attachment, upadana, gives rise to bhava. Uh, similarly, uh, all that. Uh, so that is the how uh, the five aggregates arise, the five aggregates arise from uh, attachment and attachment brings about being and then rebirth. And what monks is the passing away of body? What is the passing away of feeling, perception, volition and consciousness? Here monks, one does not seek delight, one does not welcome, one does not remain holding. And what is it that one does not seek delight in? What doesn't one welcome? To what doesn't one remain holding? One does not seek delight in body, and does not welcome it, does not remain holding to it. As a consequence of this, delight in body ceases. With the cessation of delight comes cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of being, etc. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Similarly, one does not seek delight in feeling, perception, volition and consciousness. One does not welcome it, does not remain holding to it. As a consequence of this, delight in the aggregate ceases, such and so such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. This monks is the passing away of body, it is the passing away of feeling, perception, volition, consciousness. So this last part, the Buddha says, uh, how does uh, the body uh, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness uh, cease. Uh, they cease uh, when we do not delight uh, in the five aggregates. Uh, uh, delight uh, uh, can be represented by craving. Uh, so if you have no craving, uh, then uh, the next uh, link in the chain of dependent origination, uh, uh, upadana, the clinging, uh, also stops. Uh, when clinging stops, uh, then bhava, being stops. Uh, when being stops, uh, then jati, rebirth stops. Uh, when jati, rebirth stops, uh, then aging and dying uh, and all, the whole mass of suffering uh, ceases. Uh, this is how uh, uh, body and mind, uh, the five aggregates, uh, cease. Uh, So remember the first part, uh, the Buddha says, uh, if you want to understand the five aggregates, uh, you have to develop concentration. Because when you develop concentration, samadhi, uh, especially uh, the Buddha says, uh, the perfect samadhi is the four jhanas. Uh, if you have the four jhanas, uh, then the mind becomes so clear and the mind becomes bright. Uh, and then only uh, you can see things as they really are. Uh, then you can understand the five aggregates you understand the five aggregates, uh, then uh, uh, suffering will cease. Uh. 22.6 at Savati, uh, the Buddha said, Monks, make an exertion in seclusion. A monk who is secluded understands things as they really are. And what does he understand as it really is? The origin and passing away of, and passing away of body, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness. And what monks is the origin of body, etc. The rest of the sutta is exactly the same as the previous one. The only difference here is that instead of uh, the Buddha asking us to develop concentration, then here the Buddha is asking us uh, to practice seclusion. And seclusion, um, as I mentioned before, uh, there are two types of seclusion, uh, body seclusion, kaya viveka, and uh, mental seclusion, uh, citta viveka. You know, uh, uh, kaya viveka is uh, being 
uh, physically secluded from others. Lah. Either you live alone or if you live with others in a monastery, yeah, then you, you are aloof from them. Lah. You don't associate, don't talk too much with people. Mm. And then Chitta Viveka is uh, mental seclusion. Lah. Uh, your mind is secluded from the world of the six senses. Lah. Mm. You go into deep meditation. Lah. Uh, and that is a higher form of seclusion. Uh -huh. So here the Buddha is also stressing uh, seclusion. So two things are important, uh, concentration and seclusion. Uh -huh. 22.7 at Sabati. Monks, I will teach you agitation through clinging and non-agitation through non-clinging. Listen to that and attend closely. I will speak. Yes, Venerable Sir, those monks replied. The Blessed One said, and how, monks, is there agitation through clinging? Here, monks, the unlearned, ordinary person uh, who, who does not see Aryans, uh, noble ones, uh, is unskilled and untrained in the Dhamma, who does not see superior persons and is unskilled and untrained in the Dhamma, re regards body as self, or self as possessing bod body or body as in the self, or, or self as in the body. That body of his changes and alters. With the change and alteration of body, his consciousness becomes preoccupied with the change of body. Agitation and a constellation of mental states born of preoccupation with the change of body remain obsessing his mind. Because his mind is obsessed, he is frightened, distressed and anxious and through clinging he becomes agitated. Similarly, with feeling, perception, volition and cons consciousness, uh, all these change uh, and then he becomes agitated. Uh, and all the different mental states uh, arise uh, out of his preoccupation uh, with the change. Uh, mm. So he becomes frightened, uh, distressed, etc. Uh, it is in such a way, monks, that there is agitation through clinging. Stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is saying uh, that um, uh, the ordinary, unlearned person, uh, he attaches to body, feeling, perception, volition uh, as self uh, or as belonging to self or self is in the aggregates or the aggregates are in the self la. but then when the aggregates change uh, because it is their nature to change uh, then uh, it becomes uh, mentally uh, occupied la, with this uh, change la. that means uh, he becomes agitated and he thinks about it when he thinks about it that uh, the mind proliferates la. Uh, all his worries multiply la. Uh, then he becomes uh, more agitated, uh, uh, so he becomes frightened, uh, distressed and all that. Uh, this is how uh, uh, there is agitation because of clinging. Uh. And how, monks, is there non-agitation through non-clinging? Here, monks, the unlearned, sorry, the learned noble disciple who sees noble ones and is skilled and trained in the Dhamma, who sees superior persons and is skilled and trained in the Dhamma, does not regard body as self, or self as possessing body, or body as in the self, or self as in that body. Then that body of his changes and alters. Despite the change and alteration of body, his consciousness does not become preoccupied with the change of form. I mean, he's not worried, no. he's not agitated. No agitation and constellation of mental states born of preoccupation with the change of body remain obsessing his mind. Because his mind is not obsessed, he is not frightened, distressed or anxious. And through non-clinging, he does not become agitated. Similarly, for feeling, perception, volition and consciousness. Uh, it is in such a way, monks, that there is non-agitation through non-clinging. Uh, so in the second case, uh, the person, uh, the Aryan uh, disciple uh, who is learned in the Aryan Dhamma, who is trained in the Aryan Dhamma, he does not regard the five aggregates uh, as the self or as belonging to self or 
um, the aggregates being in the self or the self as being in the aggregates. Lah. So when the five aggregates change, uh, because it is their nature to change, uh, then uh, uh, there is, he, he does not uh, worry about it. Lah. Uh, because he is not worried about it, he does not uh, become agitated uh, and obsessed with all these thoughts. Uh, then uh, he is not frightened, uh, not uh, distressed. Uh, that is how uh, there is no, no agitation uh, because of non-clinging. So it is a clinging uh, that gives us suffering. If there is no clinging, there is no suffering. Uh. Now we come to 22.18, that's on page 870. At Savati, the Buddha said, Monks, body is impermanent, body of form. The cause and condition for the arising of form or body is also impermanent. As body has originated from what is impermanent, how could it be permanent? Feeling is impermanent. Similarly, perception, volition, consciousness is impermanent. The cause and condition for the arising of the aggregates is also impermanent. As the aggregates have originated from what is impermanent, how could it be permanent? Seeing thus, he understands. Huh? Uh, seeing thus, um, the, the learned noble disciple uh, experiences revulsion towards form or body, revulsion towards feeling, perception, volition and consciousness. Experiencing revulsion, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it's liberated. He understands, destroyed is birth, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of being. So here the Buddha is saying uh, that the aggregates are impermanent uh, and the cause and condition uh, for the arising of the aggregates is also impermanent. Mm. So because the aggregates have arisen uh, from what is impermanent, uh, how can we take it to be permanent? Mm. What does this mean? Uh? This means, uh, for example, uh, one day, suppose you walk along the path and then you see a beautiful flower. Uh, when you see a beautiful flower, because it's beautiful, uh, uh, you think you want to preserve it. But then uh, this flower came about uh, because of certain conditions, uh, because of the plant was there, because of rainfall, because of sunlight because of uh, fertilizer and all that, nah, the air and all that, then the, the flower uh, emerged la, one day. But because the flower is dependent on so many conditions, eh, so and those conditions that the flower is dependent on nah, are also impermanent. So how can the flower itself be permanent? Nah, nah, nah. So for example, the flower depends on the plant itself. And the plant being a small plant, uh, one day is going to die. So when the plant dies, uh, how can the flower not die? Uh, so in the same way, uh, for example, a shadow. A shadow one day, uh, when the sun rises in the morning, uh, you see the shadow of a tree. That shadow was cast uh, because of the sun uh, being at an angle. Uh, it was cast because of the tree being solid. Uh, and then you see that shadow. But the condition for that shadow, uh, namely the sun uh, and the tree, uh, are impermanent. So very soon, uh, the sun is going to shift. When the sun shifts, uh, uh, then that shadow is not going to be there. Uh, so since the, the, the shadow uh, is impermanent and the condition for it to arise is also impermanent, uh, so the shadow is even more impermanent uh, than the condition for it to arise. Uh, right? Mm. So in the same way, our body and our mind uh, uh, is dependent on so many conditions uh, and all these conditions are impermanent. Uh, so because all these conditions that support our body and mind is impermanent, uh, then our body and mind is even more impermanent since it's dependent on so many conditions. Uh, so uh, that's how uh, we should not 
want it to be permanent because it can never be permanent. Uh, 